नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एन वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा India is in election mode by this time tomorrow the date date should be out and election funding has become a major issue here fresh data has been revealed this is related to electoral bonds it shows who gave money to which party and how much there's a lot of chatter about it we'll bring you the top 10 highlights meanwhile the border with china remains a problem beijing has conducted military drills in sensitive zones how should india see this In the US they're talking about replacing Netanyahu and a new election in Israel not America's call to make but shows you how complicated the support to Israel has become meanwhile the Houthis in the Red Sea are now looking to target the Indian Ocean we'll tell you how and why India is set to slash import tax on EVs by 85% does this mean Tesla is finally coming in South Africa a tough election for the party that has been in power for 30 years the ANC faces a perfect storm In Paris anti-drone units have been set up to secure the Olympic Games in the UK the government wants to limit foreign ownership of newspapers we'll tell you what prompted this also they're looking for the next James Bond we'll tell you how to apply and it's the season of exams students and parents are stressed we all know it's not worth it so why do we suffer we'll discuss that the headlines first Hamas proposes a 6 week Gaza truce offers to exchange dozens of Israeli hostages for Palestinian prisoners earlier this month Hamas had ruled out truce till Israel withdrew from Gaza now an Israeli team will travel to Qatar for the new talks Russians vote in their presidential election at least 9 people were held for vandalizing polling stations the voting will continue till Sunday president Vladimir Putin is widely expected to win a fifth term In India the election commission will announce the poll dates tomorrow apart from the general election four states are going to polls this summer prime minister narendra modi's nda government is hoping to secure a rare third term us officials leave niger after talks with the junta the aim was to establish contact with the junta which has moved closer to russia around 1000 american troops are stationed in niger unlike france the junta has not demanded washington pull out its forces And the family of an Ethiopian migrant sues France. The migrant was among the 27 victims who drowned in the English Channel in 2021. The family claims French authorities did not respond to calls for help. This is the first such case over the disaster. We begin with the biggest story in India, electoral bonds. After all the delays, all the legal tussles and all the political fights, the data is out. We now have a gold mine of information. Who donated to India's political parties? How much did they donate and what did each party get? All this information is now in the public domain. It's a big victory for transparency in election funding. At the same time, it's also a challenge because we're talking about a lot of data, tens of thousands of entries. I know you've been getting bits and pieces of information from different places. Some fake news is also doing the rounds and misrepresentation of facts. So tonight, we've compiled the data to bring you the 10 big highlights. Number 1, the total purchases. The data covers a specific time period. from April 2019 to February 2024 that's around 5 years in this period more than 22000 bonds were purchased some by companies some by individuals put together there were 1260 donors more than 1200 donors and how much money did they give more than 12000 crore indian rupees that's about 1.5 billion us dollars the top 20 donors are all companies together they donated around 6000 crores in other words 20 donors gave half of all the money which brings us to highlight number 2 who was the biggest donor a company called future gaming and hotel services it is based in tamil nadu's coimbatore it is headed by this man santiago martin aka lottery king it he started this company back in 1991 today it has a foothold in 13 indian states And what does this company do? Conduct lotteries. Martin has a huge network of buyers and sellers. Guess how much he donated via poll bonds? More than thirteen hundred crore rupees, which is one hundred and fifty million US dollars. 
Next is highlight number three. The second biggest donor on the list, Mega Engineering and Infrastructures. It's an unlisted company based in Hyderabad that makes tunnels and railway infrastructure. You may know some of their projects, like the Zojila Tunnel in Kashmir. And how much did, did they donate? 966 crore rupees or $116 million. Now, this company is also involved in India's first bullet train. They're making a station in Mumbai. Now we come to highlight number four, the third biggest donor, a company called Quick Supply Chain. They build warehouses and storage units. They donated some four, 410 crore rupees. That's around 50 million US dollars. Now, chances are you haven't heard of these companies. None of them are listed on the stock market. But the top 10 does have a few familiar names. And that's highlight number five, Vedanta Group slotted in as the fourth biggest donor. They gave some 400 crore rupees. At number six is, is the Bharti Group, the company that owns Airtel. They donated around 224 crore rupees. Another familiar name is Keventer, a food company based in Kolkata. They donated using three different subsidiaries. And the total? A whopping 670 crore rupees, Keventer's. All the big names of India Inc. are also on this list. ITC, Mahindra, DLF, PVR, the Birlas, Bajaj, Spicejet, Indigo, Ultratech Cements, all of them have bought electoral bonds. Next is highlight number six, an apparent trend in the donations. Many of these companies were being pursued by central agencies like the CBI and the Enforcement Directorate. Let's look at the Lottery King, for example. The ED started investigating him in 2019. By 2022, they had attached some of his assets. Five days after this attachment, the Lottery King bought pole bonds, some hundred crores of it. So there is a link, or is there a link, between the probe and the donation? We'll get to that in a bit. For now, highlight number seven. How much money did the ruling BJP get? Data shows around 6,000 crores, which is 47% of all donations. The BJP was by far the biggest beneficiary. Highlight number eight, how much money did the opposition get? Leading this list is the TMC, the Trinamool Congress that rules the state of West Bengal. They got 1,600 crore rupees, the TMC, 1,600 crore rupees. Behind the TMC is the Congress party the main opposition party in India, they got some 1,400 crore rupees. Telangana's BRS received more than 1,200 crore rupees. Odisha's Biju Janata Dal got 775 crores and Tamil Nadu's DMK got 640 crores. Now the trend here is quite clear. Ruling parties received a lion's share, both at the center and in states. Next is highlight number nine. How are political parties reacting to it? The opposition is focusing on one point, the link between central agencies and donations. They say companies were pressured to donate, sort of like extortion. They also say donations were used as kickbacks, like mining companies got permits after donating, infra companies got contracts after donating. They're calling it one donation, one party. But the ruling BJP has rejected all these charges. Finally, highlight number 10, what happens next? Well, these bonds also have a unique identification number. It links the donor to the party. And that number has not been released yet. But the Supreme Court wants it published. They've issued a notice to the State Bank of India, and that number will trigger more controversy because it's the missing link in this whole case. The SBI, the State Bank of India, should reveal that data next week. We'll see what happens then. So India is entering the election season. Poll dates are expected to be announced tomorrow. Expect high decibel campaigns and controversies and a politically charged atmosphere. But amid all of this, India's leaders cannot take their eye off China because the border situation is still precarious and the PLA is mounting a new challenge. That's the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, the Chinese Army. They recently conducted a drill at the Karakoram Plateau. This is near eastern Ladakh. It's one of the main flashpoints in the current border standoff. And China holding drills here does not augur well. The PLA says it was a live fire test. They practiced shooting at aircraft, and perhaps for the first time, female soldiers participated. Later, a Chinese mouthpiece carried this report. It says, and I quote, the female mission platoon fired live ammunition at a new subsonic target aircraft for the first time on the Karakoram Plateau 
at an altitude of 4,300 meters. The female soldiers found an enemy aircraft due east and launched the missile after a countdown. The missile took off and accurately hit the target. So this was a missile test. Reports say China used a surface-to-air missile system for this drill, and the timing does raise some questions. Why did China plan this drill now, just ahead of the elections in India? Is it trying to spark fresh tensions? Is this just posturing, or is it preparation for something worse? And here's something else that I must mention. Earlier this week, India conducted a missile test, the Agni-5, India's latest nuclear deterrent. It was tested on Monday. The Agni-5 can strike multiple targets at once. On the day of the test, a Chinese ship was near the Indian coastline, carefully watching the test unfold. We told you about this on the show. So China's test could also be a demonstration in response to India's missile test. The PLA could be showing off its capabilities. And remember, a surface-to-air missile system is exactly the kind of equipment one would use to fend off aerial attacks. It can defend against enemy aircraft from, or missiles. Now, officially, China has not given an explanation, but drills like this one only add to the existing tensions on the border. The two sides already have a high number of troops there. This month, India added another 10,000. So 10,000 more soldiers to guard the China front from the Indian side. In eastern Ladakh, there are at least 50,000 soldiers, both on the Indian and the Chinese side, facing each other across the length of the LSE. In fact, China could have up to 200,000 troops in all. And it is believed that India maintains similar levels. Now, with this kind of troop deployment, there's always the risk of an escalation. China's rhetoric only adds more fuel to the fire. The China-India border issue remains unresolved. India has no right to unilaterally develop Zhangnan, which belongs to China. China strongly opposes and deplores the activities of the Indian leader in the eastern section of the China-India border and has made solemn complaints with India. He was talking about Narendra Modi, India's Prime Minister. And what are the Chinese angry about? The Sela Tunnel. It was recently inaugurated by Prime Minister Modi. It connects two Indian states, Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. China has lodged repeated protests over this project. It stakes a claim to Arunachal Pradesh. China calls it South Tibet and says the state belongs to them, Arunachal Pradesh. But these claims have no basis, yet China keeps bringing them up and uses them to provoke India at the border. Because, and, and this is dangerous because this is a sensitive zone. With so much firepower, the India-China border is a powder keg. One wrong move could blow it up. And the world shares these concerns. Earlier this week, the U.S. intelligence community released a report about global conflicts and their assessment. And here's what it said about the India-China border standoff. I'm quoting, the shared disputed border between India and China will remain a strain on their bilateral relationship. While the two sides have not engaged in significant cross-border clashes since 2020, they're maintaining large troop deployments and sporadic encounters between opposing forces, risk, miscalculation and escalation into armed conflict. A miscalculation is what the Americans are worried about. That's also something that India is worried about. And a live fire test by China could very well lead to miscalculations. It raises the risk of more clashes. So election or not, India will have to be on alert vis-a-vis -vis China, lest it plans a misadventure as the world's largest democracy votes. Our next story is about Tesla, a company which was once considered the future of the auto industry. Today, Tesla's future seems uncertain. And India may hold the key to its survival. Tonight, we'll tell you how. 2024 has been off to a rough start for Tesla. The buzz around electric vehicles is fading, sales have plunged, and so has the valuation of Tesla. The car maker is officially the worst performer in the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is an index of America's top 500 companies. Tesla is at the bottom of this list now. Tesla shares have dropped by over 30% since January. The company's problem is growth, or the lack of it. It needs to find new customers which brings us to India. 
Could India be the solution to Tesla's problems? We ask because India is throwing the car maker a lifeline. Today, India took a significant decision. It is lowering import taxes on certain categories of EVs. Earlier, the tax rate was 100%, but now it has been reduced to 15%. So import tax has been reduced by 85%. But this rebate does not come for free. If a company wants to avail this concession, it will have to invest in India. It will have to make electric vehicles in India. And this investment must be upwards of $500 million. That's the minimum, $500 million. You have to put in $500 million to unlock this concession. Now, Tesla, as we know, has been pursuing the Indian government for this. Its founder, Elon Musk, has tried several times. Last year, he met India's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, and then he dropped some hints. Musk said Prime Minister Modi wanted Tesla to invest in India and he was on board, but he wanted to do it on his terms. Elon Musk did not want to make Teslas in India, he wanted to import the cars and sell them here, which is why he wanted the import tax to be reduced. Now under India's new rules, Musk is getting his wish. The only caveat is that he'll have to shell out at least $500 million. Now, Tesla is worth over $500 billion, so $500 million should not be a problem for them. But Tesla is not the only one looking to enter this market. There are other car makers in the fray, like Vietnam's Vinfast. It's an EV maker. Last year, it became more valuable than Ford and General Motors. But the global slowdown in EVs has caught up with Winfast too. It's in the same boat as Tesla, looking for more markets to expand. And Winfast has zeroed in on India. They've already committed $2 billion towards India. They've started building a factory in India, in the southern state of Tamil Nadu. Winfast also wanted an import duty cut. They say they want to build a customer base here with imported cars so that the brand's identity is established by the time their factory in India is up and running. They already have some takers here. Now, today's announcement will help this company too, win fast. So Tesla should move fast because the competition will be intense. It is already facing tough challenges in the US. Last year, Elon Musk was calling for trade barriers against Chinese EV makers so that he could protect his business. The US market is saturated, too many players and limited demand. On the other hand, the Indian EV market is expanding. In 2023, just 2% of the cars sold in India were EVs. By 2030, the government wants to take this up to 30%. 30% of the cars sold should be EVs by the end of this decade. So there is potential for companies like Tesla. Plus, India says it has no favorites in this fight. It won't change policies to suit one company. So basically, it's up to Elon Musk to make the most of it. In the, is the United States moving away from Israel? We've been asking this question for a while. Each time Washington says no. For good measure, they also protect Israel at the United Nations. But now it's getting harder to say no. All indications are that Joe Biden is losing patience with Benjamin Netanyahu, with his endless war. First, Netanyahu bombed Gaza. Biden supported it. Then Netanyahu sent soldiers into Gaza. Again, Biden supported it. Then Israel moved into Gaza into the Gazan safe zones in the south. Again, Biden reluctantly supported it, but now the patience is running out. This week, a US intelligence assessment was published. It warned that Netanyahu's government may fall. Of course, Israel rejected it. Senior officials accused Washington of trying to topple Netanyahu. Then yesterday, a top Democrat spoke out. His name is Chuck Schumer. He's the majority leader in the U.S. Senate. Schumer wants Israel to hold elections for a new government. I also believe Prime Minister Netanyahu has lost his way by allowing his political survival to take the precedence over the best interests of Israel. At this critical juncture, I believe a new election is the only way to allow for a healthy and open decision-making process about the future of Israel. Let me point out the obvious problem here. The U.S. does not call elections in Israel. That's not Schumer's job. But ignore the blatant meddling for a bit. Instead, focus on the message. Schumer is a political heavyweight in Washington. He's America's highest-ranking Jewish leader. So coming from him, this is an important call. The question is, does Biden feel the same way? 
obviously Congress is an independent branch of government. These are statements made by Senator Schumer, not by uh, the uh, Biden administration. Okay. So Biden doesn't feel the same way. Or maybe he does, but he doesn't want to say it. Either way, this is a crucial moment. It signals a semi-break between Israel and the U.S., a break that could hurt both sides. Israel needs military aid from the United States. They also need U.S. protection at the United Nations. If not, the Security Council can force Netanyahu to stop the war. Biden, too, needs Israel. There are 8 million Jews in the U.S., they have strong opinions about the war in Gaza, so Joe Biden cannot afford to antagonize them. If he does, they could flock towards Donald Trump. Republicans are fully behind Netanyahu. Their top leaders have called Schumer's comments, quote-unquote, disgusting. So Joe Biden has a choice to make. Does he keep defending Israel's actions or does he try to push back? Maybe even pressure Netanyahu to step down. You see, Biden has never liked the Israeli prime minister. Yes, they've known each other for, for, for many years, but that does not guarantee warmth. You may not have noticed it after October 7th. After all, the Hamas attack was a horrible tragedy, so politics was forgotten. We saw Biden and Netanyahu grieve together. But 160 days have passed. Around 30,000 Gazans have been killed, so the politics is back. We mentioned the Jewish vote bank in the U.S., but Muslim Americans are also a sizable vote bank. There are three and a half million Muslims in America, not to mention a massive liberal democratic base. They want Biden to change his policy. Let me show you what a recent poll found. 60% U.S. voters want a ceasefire in Gaza. Only 32% say Washington should support Israel. So what does Biden do? He slowly sharpens his criticism of Israel. Look at how his tone has changed. And my administration's support for Israel's security is rock solid and unwavering. Let me say this as clearly as I can. Israel has to do everything in its power. Israel has to do everything in its power. As difficult it is to protect innocent civilians, and it's difficult. My hope and expectation that uh, there will be uh, less intrusive action relative to the hospital. I've been quietly working with the Israeli government to get them to reduce and significantly get out of Gaza. I'm of the view, as you know, that the conduct of the response in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip has been um, over the top. He's hurting, in my view, he's hurting Israel more than helping Israel by making the rest of the world, it's contrary to what Israel stands for. Of course, Netanyahu is not backing down. The U.S. has urged him to not invade Rafah. It's a border town in southern Gaza, but Netanyahu remains defiant. He's preparing for a ground assault there. So I come back to the same question we started with. Is the U.S. turning away from Israel? Looking at the statements, yes, but looking at the actions, no. Because anyone can criticize and move on. What matters is backing up those words with action. And Joe Biden is not doing that. He's criticizing Israel to keep his voter base happy, but behind the scenes, he's still backing them. Let's see if that changes in the coming days. Meanwhile, the Red Sea is becoming more dangerous. The Houthis have been mounting attacks on ships. Now they harbor bigger ambitions and seem to have acquired deadlier weapons. So far, they disrupted only one maritime route, but now they want to go further. They want to stop trade altogether and extend their operations all the way to the Indian Ocean. They want to stop ships taking alternative routes. The one by the Cape of Good Hope. And how will they do this? Reports say there's a new weapon in the Houthi arsenal, a hypersonic missile. So better weapons and bigger ambitions. What do the Houthis plan to do next? Our next report tells you. The Houthis, they have become a dreaded name in the world of maritime trade. They're striking ships, businesses are spooked, supply chains are affected, and ships are now taking a longer route to avoid them. 
Despite global condemnation, the Houthis are undeterred. They already control the Red Sea. And now they have a bigger target. They're going to increase their area of influence. Our main battle is to prevent ships associated with the Israeli enemy, not only from passing through the Arabian Sea, the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, but also with the grace and assistance of Allah Almighty. We aim to prevent their crossing through the Indian Ocean and from South Africa towards the Cape of Good Hope. Global trade relies heavily on the Suez Canal. That means passing through the Red Sea. It's the shortest route between Europe to Asia, which is why ships prefer it. 12% of global trade passes through the Red Sea every year. That's worth over $1 trillion. Once the Houthis started targeting this route, ships were forced to take a detour. They're sailing all the way around Africa through the Cape of Good Hope. Of course, it's a much longer route. It adds almost 3,500 nautical miles. That's over a week of extra sailing. But it's safer, which is why ships are taking this route. And now, the Houthis want to extend their attacks. They want to make sure that ships can't pass through the Cape of Good Hope either. They don't just want to disrupt maritime trade, they want to stop it altogether. The Houthis primarily operate in the Gulf of Aden. They are now planning to expand operations to the Indian Ocean. That way they can stop any ship before it even reaches the Cape of Good Hope. So the Yemeni rebels have lofty ambitions and they seem to be getting some new weapons to fuel them. Like the hypersonic missile. Russian state media claims that the Houthis have one hypersonic missile. It also claims that they have tested it successfully. If it's true, it puts the Houthis in an elite club. Only a handful of nations have this technology, the likes of the US, Russia and China. Of course, the claims can't be verified, but if true, it gives them a huge advantage. Hypersonic weapons fly at speeds higher than Mark V. That's five times the speed of sound. The one in the Houthi arsenal is supposed to be Mark VIII. Basically, eight times the speed of sound. Not just that, the Houthis intend to manufacture even more weapons. It would give them the power to attack more targets, posing a formidable challenge for Israel as well as the US. This means only one thing. The conflict in West Asia is spilling over. The Houthis started with a warning. They followed it up with attacks. Countries tried to deter them, but nothing has stopped them yet. Now they have better weapons and bigger ambitions. They began in the Gulf of Aden. Now they want to move to the Indian Ocean. The battle at the high seas has just begun and will likely escalate in the coming days. Now let's turn our attention to South Africa. It's the third richest country in Africa, home to more than 62 million people. And it's going to polls this year on May 29th. This year, we may see an unusual election in South Africa. After 30 years, it seems the country is ready for change. After 30 years, the ruling party may finally have exhausted its goodwill. Let me explain. South Africa was once known for apartheid, a system of legalized racial segregation. People were divided and treated differently on the basis of race. And that system ended only in 1990, largely because of Nelson Mandela and his party, the African National Congress or ANC. The first election after that, after apartheid, took place in 1994, exactly 30 years ago. And Nelson Mandela became president, the first president of post-apartheid South Africa. His party, the ANC, took over the reins of government and it has ruled South Africa for all of the last 30 years, the same party, ANC. Mandela himself was president only for one term. He did not lead the party in the second term, the second election, which was in 1999. But Mandela was always around, lending his grace to the ANC till he passed in 2013. And even after Mandela stepped down in 1999, the ANC kept winning election after election. In fact, its seat share rose till 2004. But ever since, it's been a downward spiral. Year after year, the ANC loses supporters. And it seems this year, it may not even be able to reach the halfway mark. South Africa's lower house of parliament has 400 seats. You need 201 to win an election outright. The ANC has always managed this in the past, but this time it looks tough. 
Look at the opinion polls. The latest one shows the ANC polling at 39%, not even 40, 39%. For the party that helped free the country from apartheid, this is a fall from grace, which begs the question, how did it come to this? There are a number of factors, economic and political. We'll start with the economy. South Africa's growth rate last year was 0.6%, 0.6. This is a BRICS country. It's supposed to be driving growth in the world. But it barely avoided a recession. Fourth quarter growth was a measly 0.1%, positive, but barely. 0.1. What's worse, South Africa's economy is about the same size as it was in 2020 when the Wuhan virus pandemic hit. Four years and it has just recovered. Unemployment overall has crossed 30%. Youth unemployment is even higher at about 43%. And this has infuriated South African voters. Along with poor growth, there's poor infrastructure. South Africa is known for frequent power outages. And for almost two weeks, Johannesburg has been facing a water crisis. This, remember, is South Africa's richest city, Johannesburg, home to about 6 million people. Half of them have been facing water issues. The government pointed to an ongoing drought. It also blamed water companies, but the people of Johannesburg are fed up. At the end of the day, we pay our taxes. Now show us what it's for. There, enough of this finger pointing, enough. It's got to come to a point where there is accountability plans of action and follow through. That's it. So we need water. Government should supply. Yes, we're paying for nothing. Paying for air. So there are economic issues, infrastructure issues, accountability issues. Add to this mix a magic ingredient. Political intrigue. And what do you get? The perfect storm. The political alchemist may very well be an old ANC hand. Jacob Zuma, a former president who has now trained his guns on the party he once led. Zuma has left the ANC and polls say he has taken 13% of their votes with him. Zuma was embroiled in corruption scandals. He even spent months in detention because of them. But a lot of ANC leaders have corruption charges against them. So it has not really affected Zuma's popularity. And he's using this to turn the screws on the ANC. The current president of the country, Cyril Ramaphosa. Zuma is emerging as his chief rival. So this election is, is, is essentially between Ramaphosa and Zuma. That's what this is all about. If you look at the Ramaphosa-led ANC, and what the country has become here in South Africa, there is a serious need for change. And South Africans have realized that. Of course, his party will talk up his chances, but Zuma does change the equation. He will take away ANC voters, and he may bring the party below the halfway mark, which means the ANC's only option might be coalition politics. They could still be ruling South Africa after May, but it will be in a severely weakened state dependent on other parties to survive. And that would be a great fall for the party that ended apartheid. But it's also a lesson. Do not become complacent, do not become corrupt, and do your best to govern well. Reputation will only last so long. It's a lesson that parties around the world would do well to learn. Now let's turn our attention to Paris. The French capital has a nickname, the City of Lights. But the type of lights may change soon. Instead of the usual ones, Paris is about to get lasers. Not for illumination. These lasers have a different purpose. Paris is setting them up to destroy drones. These are anti-drone units. France is beefing up security in its capital. This is ahead of the Olympics. The Olympic Games begin in July, and France is leaving nothing to chance. Here's our report. France is readying itself. It is hosting the Olympics this year, and preparations for the Games are in full swing. But it isn't just construction and beautification. There are also security arrangements to be made. And it looks like France may be going a bit overboard with that, because Paris has decided that it must protect itself from a very modern threat, drones. When you think of drones, what do you picture? The little quadcopters used to make aerial videos or drop off Amazon packages? In a war setting, you may imagine the famous battle drones like Turkey's Bayraktar TB2 or even Iran's Shahed 136 kamikaze drones. 
France is wary of all of these, and it has created a special force to deal with them. Enter the Section Protection Appui drone. This new force will be protecting the Parisian skies from terrorists and apparently protesters as well. Le drone. So when I talk about threats by protesters, it could be a banner hung to express certain opinions that you wouldn't want to see on an Olympic site. But the most dangerous threat, of course, is a drone used for terrorist purposes. Drone-mounted bombs and banners will be shot down with a state-of-the-art French anti-drone system. This includes the Nero RF and Nero F55 jammers. The way they work is simple enough. When a drone is in the crosshairs, a jammer rifle fires a beam of radio waves at it. The beam overloads the drone's receiver, meaning it can't get commands from the person operating it. This renders the drone immobile, allowing different means of disposal, like a net thrown by this gun, the Skywall Drone Defense System. But if that doesn't work, there are more explosive alternatives. See these vans with the big camera-like thing on it? That isn't for taking panoramic shots. That is a portable anti-drone laser. Now these won't melt the entire drone. They aren't that advanced yet. But they can burn the drone's control system. Again, incapacitating it. Or even overheat the drone's explosive payload, causing it to detonate mid-air before it reaches its target. All of this may seem like sci-fi warfare, but it's making its way to our day-to-day -day lives. France is relying on this to protect the Olympic Games. We are ready to protect the Olympic Games and to ensure that these games are a celebration for everyone. We are putting the best systems in place. We are the ones dealing with threats from the air. Even if they don't see much action, their presence will serve another purpose. France is an arms exporter, and this anti-drone brigade is a great advertisement. Their patrols may intrigue potential buyers, making it a win-win for France, even if they don't win any golds in the Olympics. What qualifies as a strategic industry? Defense, yes, also space exploration, maybe even steel and metal. But what about news media? Your newspapers, magazines and television channels, do they qualify as a strategic industry? Britain seems to think so. The government has announced a new policy. It will ban foreign regimes from owning UK newspapers and magazines. Why did London need this policy? Because the UAE was looking to buy British papers, specifically two of them, The Telegraph and The Spectator. And why were they selling? Reports say the Telegraph owners have a lot of debt, some one and a half billion dollars of it. A UAE investment firm has agreed to clear that. In exchange, they wanted to take over the newspaper, complete Emirati control. But the UK lawmakers opposed it. Around 100 of them wrote a letter opposing the takeover. That's when the government stepped in. They formulated this new ban on ownership. The next step is for the parliament to pass it. Shouldn't be a hassle, though, because the opposition Labour also supports it. So now we know where the UK draws the line. Football clubs are fine, real estate is fine, retail chains are fine, but news media is not. Of course, there's a political angle here. The Telegraph is a favourite of Conservative leaders, so they want it to remain British. Well, they've got their wish. Because the UAE's takeover attempt has been halted, the Telegraph has now appointed a new chairman. His job is to deal with the fallout. Mission accomplished here. But this controversy also raises bigger questions. Do foreign governments and investors own media assets elsewhere? Are there rules to stop it? And if not, what is the impact? Let's look at Britain first. Three firms dominate 90% of their newspaper market. One of them is News UK, owned by American billionaire Rupert Murdoch. He, owns, he also owns Fox News in the US. So Murdoch controls one third of Britain's newspaper market. He publishes a number of magazines like The Sun and The Times. Other examples are The Independent and The Evening Standard. Both were acquired by a Russian holding company, one that was founded by a former KGB agent. So pretty close to Kremlin. Across the Atlantic in the US, it's a billionaire's game. Most publications are owned by America's richest, but there are a few exceptions, like the New York Times. In 2008, Mexican billionaire Carlos Slim 
help them out. This was during the financial crisis. Slim loaned NYT around $250 million. In exchange, he got around 8% stake in the company. In 2015, he bought more shares. Slim doubled his stake to almost 17%. He became the NYT's largest shareholder. Since then, he's offloaded some of that. And that's the situation in the US. What about India? India does allow foreign investment in news media, but there are limits. Major changes were introduced in the year 2000. Up to 26% foreign investment was allowed in print media. In news broadcasting, it was 20%. And non-news outlets, 49%. Non-news media. So the message was clear. Foreign money is welcome, but the control must remain with India. In 2006, these limits were, were tweaked. FDI in news channels, foreign direct investment in news channels was increased from 20 to 26 percent. Non-news channels were permitted 100 percent. Another change was made in 2015. FDI in news channels was increased again from 26 to 49 percent. Both print and digital media have a lower limit, only 26%. Now, foreign investment has brought in a lot of money, even in the information and broadcasting industry. The FDI in 2023 was almost 3,700 crore rupees. It was a 230% jump than the year before. And this money does help, especially at a time when the media landscape is changing. Having said that, there are challenges. For starters, what if foreign ownership leads to bias? It's a real possibility in the media, especially when foreign governments buy a stake. Let's say the UAE succeeded in buying the Telegraph. What would stop them from appointing favorable editors or publishing puff pieces on the UAE? Nothing. Another issue is national security. The media can influence public opinion maybe on a new trade deal or a new set of sanctions or an investment project. So having a foreign owner can be a conflict of interest. Does that mean a ban is necessary? Well, curbs and limits also work fine. Yes, strategy and security are involved here, but that can't be an excuse to choke an industry. As always, a middle ground is the answer. For our next story, let me ask you a question. Do you want to be the next James Bond? If the answer is a yes, a puzzle could take you closer to your dreams. The UK spy agency has released a riddle for potential new recruits. It's on their LinkedIn page. It's a picture with clues. If you can solve it, they may hire you. Basically, you could be one step closer to being a real life James Bond. So can you work out this mind bending riddle? Do you have what it takes to become a spy? Our next report will tell you. Martinis shaken, not stirred. High-speed car chases. Villains petting hairless cats. The world of 007 has long been an elusive dream. Most people love him and few hate him. But everyone secretly wants to be James Bond. If you're dreaming of one such would-be spy, a cryptic puzzle could make you the next Bond. It was released by the GCHQ, the Government Communications Headquarters. It's UK's largest intelligence agency. It works along with the MI5 and MI6. Currently, 7,181 people work there, but the GCHQ is looking for new recruits. Usually, they would take tests, conduct interviews, but this time they are trying something different, visual puzzles. The spy agency has posted the riddle on its LinkedIn page. It's this cryptic picture. It has 13 clues. Each clue forms a letter. Together, those letters form a message. And if you can decipher that message, rush to the GCHQ. They'll want you. Of course, that is if you're a UK citizen. Sorry to break some hearts there. So what's the point of this puzzle? GCHQ says puzzles are at the heart of their work. The agency is best known for its operations during World War II. It relocated to Bletchley Park. Among its staff was Alan Turing. He famously decrypted coded German messages. They were sent using the Enigma cipher machine. It had once seemed impenetrable, but Turing cracked it. It helped save lives and even ended the war early. So puzzles are indeed important to the GCHQ.
but this one is meant to attract lateral thinkers, those who never thought of working in intelligence. And that's what the GCHQ director stressed on. She said, and I quote, We're on a journey to make sure that we reach out and connect to people who've never thought of working with us. The British spy agency has already published the answer on its page. They haven't told us if anyone cracked it. But the enigmatic puzzle remains a testament to the never-ending allure of the spy world. You can still try solving the puzzle. They may not hire you, but when you unravel that last clue, you will at least know in your heart that you have it in you to be the next James Bond. In India, March is the season of spring, a time of blooming flowers and blue skies. But here, the young don't bring out picnic baskets. Instead, they hunch over revision notes. Their cramming riffs reach feverish levels and countdown clocks start ticking faster. Because in India, March is also the season of stress. Students across the nation take crucial exams, final semester tests, graduating board exams, entrance tests, and there is one thing Western sitcoms do not get wrong about India. Exams are a very big deal here. Family life comes to a standstill. Weddings and birthday parties are postponed. The Prime Minister gives his best wishes. All of this before students enter the exam dungeon. Then they're on their own. They're not allowed to ask for help. They can't take a little more time. They must pretend to think when a teacher passes them and they're judged on the outcome. Not sure how everyone finds out that the results are out, but they do. And phones start ringing off the hook. If the result is good, there are gifts and sweets. So many sweets. But if the outcome is bad, uh -uh, the entire family goes through the five stages of grief. So you get the gist. But you're mistaken if you think exams are a big deal only in India. Take Gao Kao, for instance. This is China's final school exam, and it is the toughest exam, not just in China, not just for schools. Gao Kao is the toughest test among all the tests in the world, apparently. Chinese students overcome impossible expectations to ace it. Or look at the Sun Yung, South Korea's final school exam. It is eight hours long and highly challenging. On the day of this exam, flights are halted, businesses open late, and the army pauses its exercises. It's a whole thing. Because across the world, grades are treated like tokens of exchange, and education is seen as a means of trade for social and economic access. A good college, a good job, a good house, a good marriage prospect, a good life, and good grades promise all of this. Often this is also the case. Acing exams can alter the course of one's life. So not taking away from the importance of grades or the accomplishment of those who score high. But exams and grades are not the only thing that define your life. There are enough and more examples of those who did not score well, but did well in life. So there is no reason to put children under immense pressure. It won't boost grades. It will only increase mental health issues like anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. Let me give you the example of Canada. Mental health-related hospital admissions among teens are at a peak between January and April. That's the exam season in Canada. And they're the lowest during July, August, and December, which is when schools are closed. In England, similarly, such hospital admissions are at a peak during term exams. They're at the lowest during holidays. In America, suicide attempts by teenagers are rarer during non-school months. What about India? Suicide among students rose by 70% between 2011 and 2021, 70%. In 2021, more than 13,000 students died by suicide. That's around 35 deaths every single day. Sure, exams are not the only reason here, but they were behind at least 8% of these deaths. And this is criminal. Do you know what's behind this crime? A mutual societal expectation and belief that grades are everything, that exams are the be-all and end-all of life. They're not. They're just a means to an end. So study hard, but do not punish yourself. You're a lot more than your scorecard, and there's always a next time. And now it's time for Vantage Shorts, images that tell the story. Top tennis players go undercover as staff at the ongoing Indian Wells Open. In the US, a major snowstorm wreaks havoc in parts of Colorado. And in Antarctica, scientists warn of a bird flu epidemic after several cases are detected in penguins. Finally, we're taking you back in history on this day in 1917. Tsar Nicholas II was forced to abdicate in Russia. He was deposed during the Russian Revolution. A year later, he and his family were 
executed by the Bolsheviks. Nicholas II was the last Tsar of Russia. We're leaving you on that note. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.